This is Chris Webb from the Texas State Physical Therapy Department and along with Samantha Richter, Ashley Trotter, and Justin Walker, I will be discussing Liz Franck injuries. In this presentation, we'll be going over the history, the definition, clinical presentation, as well as the mechanism of injury, imaging, treatment, and clinical bottom line of Liz Franck injuries. Jacques Lisfranc was a surgeon in Napoleon's army and performed an amputation between the midfoot and forefoot of a soldier who fell and caught his foot in the stirrup. The incidence of Lisfranc fractures is only 1 in 55,000 per year, which accounts for 0.2% of all fractures in a given year. Lisfranc fractures are also easily missed on initial x-ray and can be difficult to diagnose. Lisfranc joint complex is actually another name for all of the tarso-metatarsal joints, but the Lisfranc joint typically only refers to the first and second joints, which are in turn attached by a Lisfranc ligament that attaches the medial cuneiform to the base of the second metatarsal. Injury to the Lisfranc ligament can result in functional instability and losses in the height of the longitudinal and transverse arches of the foot. A Lisfranc injury includes sprain, dislocation, and also even a fracture of the Lisfranc joint. And this is important as the first and second metatarsal and medial cuneiform provide stability and weight transfer during gait. As PTs, we need to be aware of the signs and symptoms that may present in the clinic as an undiagnosed Lisfranc fracture. And these signs and symptoms will present as pain, especially with activities involving weight bearing, focal tenderness over the top of the foot, which often presents with edema, as well as deformity and instability. Lisfranc fractures also commonly present as plantar ecchymosis, and we can see a picture of what that would look like here. Right? And depending on the mechanism of injury, this can also give us a higher suspicion of Lisfranc injury. One thing we need to remain cautious about is the anatomy over the dorsum of the foot. With a Lisfranc fracture, the injury is typically with a second metatarsal, the dorsalis pedis artery, and the deep fibular nerve over the dorsum of this structure. Compartment syndrome is also another emergent complication that needs to be screened. Another key finding for Lisfranc injuries along with the clinical presentations is passive motion. You can address passive supination and pronation of the TMT joints as well as passive dorsiflexion and abduction of the forefoot. And pain with either of these mov movements will increase suspicion of fracture. There is a midfoot squeeze test in which you are looking for pain or a clicking sound when squeezing the first and second metatarsals together. However, research into the validity and reliability of both of these assessments do not indicate a high level of sensitivity or specificity. Mechanisms of injury could be anything that assert abnormal forces to the TMT joints, which can include hyperextending the forefoot and any injury during a motor vehicle accident where the foot is trapped under the pedal and ends up getting crushed during the accident. The mechanism of injury can be either direct or indirect. Direct injuries are when force is applied directly to the dorsum of the Lisfranc joint complex. Indirect injuries are more common and result in subluxation of the second metatarsal base on the intermediate cuneiform. Most commonly, they dislocate dorsally, which can be seen in soccer when a soccer player gets kicked right underneath the foot. These injuries are seen in athletes when the athlete has loading on a plantar flexed foot, which results in further hyperplantar flexion and rupture of the Lisfranc ligament, and are rarely associated with complications vascularly. In 2002, the Nunley et al. classification system began being used. And with this, stage one is typically a sprain and you will not see any losses in the arch height and no distance in the space of the metatarsals. Stage two, you'll see a disruption in the space between the first and second metatarsals, but no loss in the arch height. And stage three results in diastasis and a loss of arch height. And the table at the bottom here lays out the different stages in relation to imaging techniques used to diagnose Liz Franck fractures. And this is just a diagram emphasizing what you will see with each injury. And remember that the difference between stage two and three is that in stage three, there will be a loss in arch height. Surgeons will use a different classification system, which will include homolateral and divergent, which differ in the ways that the metatarsals are shifted. This classification system used by surgeons is generally a way of communicating the injury presentation rather than predicting the success of the treatment. 
This picture depicts the difference between homolateral and divergent. And as we can see in homolateral, the metatarsals are shifted laterally, and in divergent, the first metatarsal is shifted medially while the others are shifted laterally. Imaging is going to play an important role in diagnosing, staging, and classifying Lisfranc franc injuries. The first mode of imaging is typically a plain film x-ray, AP, uh, lateral and oblique, and then weight-bearing views are typically preferred because they will show stress to osseous structures as a result of ligamentous injuries. The hallmark sign is the flex sign, which implicates complete avulsion of the Lisfranc franc ligament. CT scans also play a very important role in looking at the widening of the joint spaces and any associated fractures and helps to formulate the surgical treatment plan. MRIs are not routinely used, but they can be useful to evaluate the soft tissue damage because it looks at the Lisfranc franc ligament itself. Doppler ultrasound may be used because it can check for the integrity of the dorsalis pedis artery if the foot is swollen and cannot be felt by simple palpation. Treatment depends on the severity of the patient. Rice is the first line of defense since edema is very common with these injuries. The goal of all treatment is painless plantigrade stability of the foot functionally regardless of severity. Stage 1 and stage 2 typically have excellent outcomes with their prospective interventions. However, stage 3 outcomes are not as well reported and will be patient specific due to the severity of the injury. Stage 1 is typically conservative treatment involving non-weight bearing for 4-6 to six weeks in a booter cast and will need follow-up imaging at 2 weeks to check for proper anatomical alignment. Post-casting and an orthotic may be used for support of the longitudinal arch and physical therapy typically involves 3-6 to six weeks of balancing gait training with a gradual return to activity and typical recovery time being three to four months. Education is very important with these patients as they need to realize that this isn't a typical sprain and that they need to allow for complete soft tissue healing to occur. As physical therapists, we need to optimize the patient's gait pattern and make a referral for orthotics if needed. Treatment should include strengthening of the foot and ankle muscles to increase joint stability, proprioception and balance retraining, and taping to increase plantar flexion of the first ray and assist with gradual return to activities. Non-conservative treatment procedures for stage two or three typically involve surgery. Open reduction internal fixation is typically considered the gold standard. K-wires have also been used and studies show that arthrodesis is the last option and is typically used in severe post-traumatic arthritis. It can take up to a year to recover and patients need to follow strict non-weight bearing protocols post-surgery for eight weeks then followed by the typical conservative physical therapy treatment. The most common complication is post-traumatic arthritis which is present in most but isn't always symptomatic. It is related to initial injury and adequacy of initial reduction. If post-traumatic arthritis becomes debilitating, surgery can be completed to reduce symptoms. Other complications include compartment syndrome, infection, complex regional pain syndrome, neurovascular injury, and hardware failure. Rehabilitation can take up to one full year. If the patient is an athlete with a stage 3 and plays a high impact sport, it could affect their long term career, and early detection is key for decreasing long term complications. Initial anatomical reduction predicts outcomes and decreases rate of post-traumatic arthritis and need for further surgery later. Clinicians should maintain a high clinical suspicion for this injury as they are difficult to diagnose. Early and accurate diagnosis is essential to increase chances of returning to prior level of activity and decreasing complications. Patient education is key. Discussions regarding the length of recovery magnitude of injury, and potential complications is essential. Thank you for listening to our presentation on Lisfranc injuries, and here are our references.